One of my favorite metaphors for both the human journey and the spiritual journey is the metamorphosis of the caterpillar into the butterfly. Isn't it just remarkable? Like This is not a fairy tale. This happens. It really happens. That profound transition from, from one form of life to another, from uh, one realm of possibility and potential to another. This is the promise at the heart of Christianity that we can transform into a divine identity. But it's not a guarantee. It's a promise, but it's not a guarantee. I want you to think of all the transitions or some of the transitions that you've navigated through life. Some have navigated more than others. From baby to toddler, you probably don't remember that one. From child to teenager, from teen to adult, from study to the workplace, for some of us here, for many of us, from single to married, and then the even bigger transition to parenthood, and then think of all the transitions that happen as a parent. From one child to two children, big transition, huh? And then from parenting a a child to parenting a teenager, that's different. And then from parenting a teenager to parenting an adult, different again. And then, of course, uh, the transition from work to retirement. Some of us have navigated that one. The, The transitions go on and on. And they are almost always challenging. I guess that's because they have a very important role to play. You see, these moments of change are supposed to keep us developing psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, so that this new life, this butterfly, can emerge from within. But have you ever noticed that it is possible to navigate all of these changes in our life without really changing ourselves. Have you noticed that in yourself or perhaps in others? It's possible to go through all of those transitions without actually transforming, which is supposed to be what it's all about. One thing I've learned along the way is that transformation doesn't just happen you've got to want it you've got to want it so I want to suggest as we begin tonight a good question to ask yourself is do I really want transformation do I want this divine identity that God is inviting me into do I really value it is that why I come to church The title of my homily today is The Essential Journey. I want to reflect on what I think is perhaps the most important transition that we need to take in our lives. And it's not as obvious as the other ones I've mentioned, but I think it's the transition that leads to the greatest transformation. And we see this transition playing out, I think, most Uh, clearly in the life of St Paul. I want to reflect a little bit on Paul's life tonight and I want to do that by kind of um, dividing his life into two halves. I want to suggest that there's two parts to Paul's life, right? The first part is Paul the Jew, the devout Jew, who of course at that time was called Saul, yeah? In his letters, Paul, a, a few times, he talks about um, his life back back then, right? And he talks about, in a particular way, how determined he was with his faith. He says, I, I trained under the best Jewish teachers. I was zealous for God. I was faultless in following the law. I was a good religious man. I did it all right. You can hear his striving, can't you? striving after God. 
doing everything he could to get closer. That should sound familiar to us. Does it sound familiar? Most of us who take the journey of faith seriously, we start the journey in the same way as Paul or as Saul. We see the journey towards God looking something like this. That God's up there and in order to get there, I need to put in lots of effort. Yeah? It looks something like that. We need to do the right things in order to sort of climb that ladder towards God. And so we say our prayers, we learn about our faith, we try and follow the teachings of Jesus, we make an effort to be good people, we put our rosary over the rear view mirror in our car, and we say, God bless you. We try and do all the right things, yeah? We try and say all the right things. But have you noticed that doing all the right things doesn't necessarily change you. Have you notice that? It doesn't always make you more loving, more joyful. Despite Saul's knowledge and his religious perfection, at that stage of his life, he was not changing very much either. He was not transforming. He was not growing in love. We see in the life of Saul that striving for God does not always lead to sanctity. We could argue, in his case, it was quite the opposite. But then, of course, he had his moment with Jesus, that encounter on the road that literally put him on his bum, yeah, on his backside, blinded him. And it was that moment of humiliation it was that moment of powerlessness that kick-started Paul onto what I'm calling today the essential journey, that, 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 that transition from, from striving to surrender. It was that shift that opened up for Paul the second half of his journey. Where, where he, he, his whole identity shifted from Saul to Paul and then later, of course, to St. Paul, a man who had such a tremendous impact on our church and, and on the world. Now, the key gift for Paul in that moment of encounter with Jesus on the road, the, the, the key thing that made all the difference for him, I think, was the realisation that actually... We don't so much find our way to God, but God actually makes his way towards us, even in the midst of all of our weakness and our failures, which is exactly what Paul experienced on the road, yeah? God coming to him. And that's what, again, he's stressing in our second reading today. He's... Um, He's talking about, or he's acknowledging, Paul's acknowledging his spiritual gifting, right? But then he says, so he says, I was having extraordinary revelations, yeah? But to stop me getting too proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me and stop me from getting too proud. Now, we don't know what this thorn in the flesh was, yeah? The scholars all sort of have different ideas. Some say, well, it could have been um, a physical ailment. It could have been a psychological Maybe, maybe Paul had some mental health issues or it could have been a temptation he was struggling with, a, a pattern of sin. We, we, we don't know. Whatever it was, Paul was obviously troubled by it. And so he said, I, I pleaded with God that he would take it away. And here's what God says to Paul. Paul, my grace is enough for you. In fact, God said, my power is at its best in your weakness. It's at its best. This must have been so confusing for Paul. It would have messed up his whole religious system, yeah? Which to that point was based on his effort, was based on his perfection. But now God was saying, no, Paul, that's not the journey of a spiritual life. 
This is kind of more like the journey of the spiritual life. Thanks, Dan. Our effort, our active pursuit, it gets us going and it's important trying to do the right things, trying to follow the teachings of our faith, prayer, all that stuff's important. It gets us going. But there will come a moment in our journey when we realise that all of our effort, all of our striving, all of our perfection will only get us so far. It'll only change us so much. And that realisation normally comes about through an experience of suffering. When we are knocked on our backside like Saul. Maybe it's when someone we love dies. Or or maybe it's um, through a a big failure in our lives. Or maybe it's it's a, a breakdown in relationship. Or it could just be that all of a sudden we just start feeling flat, depressed, lost, disoriented. Those moments can often feel like a crisis, can't they? It can feel like something is wrong. Maybe I'm going backwards. Maybe I'm losing my faith. I'm I'm sort of going down. But what St Paul is saying here today is that actually these moments of crisis are a great opportunity to take the essential journey. To let go of our striving and instead to surrender to the power of God's love. Which is what ultimately transforms us. Not our effort, not our perfection, not our striving. None of that stuff ultimately changes us. It's, it's the power of love that changes us. This is why St Paul says these crazy words today. I shall be very happy to make my weakness my special boast so that the power of Christ may stay over me. Who in their right mind would say that? Do you rejoice in your sufferings and your trials? Only someone who has truly found power in his powerlessness would say something like that. That's a promise for all of us. If we're willing to take that essential journey from striving, from trying, from controlling, to trust and to surrender and to waiting, to working with God, seeing life as a partnership. It doesn't mean we don't make an effort, we don't try and put our best foot forward, but we, we do it in collaboration. In order for the butterfly to emerge, the body of the caterpillar first needs to literally break down. That's what happens. And I, I can imagine the poor little caterpillar doesn't feel so good in that moment, right? But that's what opens the way for the new life to emerge, for the butterfly to break forth. This is the pattern that we see in so many of the great myths and the stories throughout the centuries. The hero often needs to go through some kind of loss, some kind of suffering and death. But it's through the death that he discovers his soul and his purpose and his true power. Jesus said it like this, in order for the seed to grow, it needs to first die. So what if this is true for you? What if? What if your failures and your weakness and your suffering were not obstacles but actually They were the special way to God. They were vehicles to a higher life. What might be a situation in your life right now that is inviting you to take that essential journey from from striving to surrender? Or to use psychological language, from, from ego to soul? What's the situation right now that you can capitalise on? This transition, it, you can't make it happen, right? It'll, it'll happen, you know, when we, that sort of being knocked down, 
um, it, it just happens when it happens. We can't push it, right? Uh, but I want to offer you something tonight just to help that process along a little bit. Here's one practical thing you can do. I want to suggest that whenever you have a prayer time, uh, allow part of that time for you just to sit with God. Don't say anything. Don't ask for anything. Try not to think about anything. Just, just, just be with God and allow God to love you. Consciously receive the love of God. Every time you do that, you are reminding yourself that you do not need to strive. You do not need to get it perfect because you already have God. God is constantly giving himself to you wherever you are and exactly as you are. 